Okay, today is a very exciting day because in a few hours I'm going to be announcing officially my candidacy for President of the United States. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, and I'm running because I think we need some fundamental economic and political change in this country. Uh, we need a movement of ordinary Americans that says to the billionaire class, you can't have it all. Uh, this country, our government, belong to all of us and not just to a handful of very, very wealthy people. That's essentially what this campaign is about. Uh, and what I will be talking about today and what I will be uh, talking about throughout this campaign is a series of proposals that address this obscene level of income and wealth inequality that creates the millions of jobs we desperately need, that make college affordable, that it deals with Citizens United and, and, and stops this ability of billionaires to buy elections, that deals uh, with climate change. These are the issues that the American people are concerned about. These are the issues that we're going to deal with, and I think we have some pretty good ideas as to how to address them. Uh, we're going to win this election if, in fact, we can mobilize large numbers of people in 50 states who simply say, all right, we've had it, you know, uh, enough is enough. And this country has got to belong to all of us. And that's the theme, and uh, I'll be around the country uh, espousing those ideas. Today, here in our small state, a state that has led this nation in so many ways, I am proud to announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. Today, Today, with your support and the support of millions of people throughout our country, we begin a political revolution to transform our country economically, politically, socially, and environmentally. Today, we stand here and say loudly and clearly Enough is enough. This great nation and its government belong to all of the people and not to a handful of billionaires. Brothers and sisters, now is not the time for thinking small. Now is not the time for the same old, same old establishment politics and stale inside the beltway ideas. Now is the time for millions of working families to come together to revitalize American democracy, to end the collapse of our middle class, and to make certain that our children and grandchildren are able to enjoy a quality of life that brings them health, prosperity, security, and joy and that once again makes the United States the leader in the world in the fight for economic and social justice, for environmental sanity, and for a world of peace. Bernie Sanders is the junior senator from Vermont, a socialist and independent. He caucuses with the Democrats. He was the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and served 16 years in the House of Representatives before winning election to the United States Senate in 2006. This spring, he announced his candidacy for the Democratic presidential nomination, calling for a massive redistribution of income to address inequalities, a crash effort on climate change, and an end to the influence of special interest money in politics. He had been considered a quixotic challenger to the formidable frontrunner Hillary Clinton. But he is drawing huge crowds in New Hampshire and Iowa, and last weekend came in a close second to Ms. Clinton in a straw poll at the Wisconsin Democratic State Convention. Bernie Sanders, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Why are you the best choice for President of the United States? Because for the last 30 years, I've been standing up for the working families of this country, and I think I'm the only candidate who is prepared to take on the billionaire class, which now controls our economy 
and increasingly controls the political life of this country. We need a political revolution uh, in this country involving millions of people who are prepared to stand up and say enough is enough and I want to help lead that. Is it really possible for someone who calls himself a socialist to be elected president of the United States? Well, so long as we know what democratic socialism is. And if we know that in countries in Scandinavia, like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they are very democratic countries. Obviously, the voter turnout is a lot higher than it is in the United States. In those countries, health care is a right of all people. In those countries, college education, graduate school is free. Uh, in those countries, retirement benefits, child care are stronger than in the United States of America. And in those countries, by and large, Government works for ordinary people in the middle class rather than, as is the case right now in our country, uh, for the billionaire I class. can hear the Republican attack ad right now. He wants America to look more like Scandinavia. That's right. That's right. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong when you have more income and wealth equality? What's wrong when we, they have uh, a stronger middle class in many ways than we do, a higher minimum wage uh, than we do, and they're stronger on the environment than we do? Look, the fact of the matter is we do a lot in our country, which is good. But we can learn from other countries. We have, George, the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth at the same time as we're seeing a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires. Frankly, I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think that's what America is about. Uh, I grew up in a low income, low, low middle class income uh, family in Brooklyn, New York, three and a half room rent controlled apartment. And growing up without a whole lot of money, George, that has been, uh, I think, the most significant educational factor, if you like, in my life. I know what it's like to live in a family without a lot of money. You told my colleague John Carl this week that you have some concerns about the money raised by the Clinton Foundation. What are those concerns exactly? Well, it's not just the Clinton Foundation. Here are my concerns, George, and it should be the concern of every American. And, and this is, in a sense, what my campaign is about. Can somebody who is not a billionaire, who stands for working families, actually win an election in which billionaires are pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the election. It's not just Hillary. It is the Koch brothers. It is Sheldon Adelson. We but you're are lumping her in with them. What I am saying is that I get very frightened about the future of American democracy when this becomes a battle between billionaires. I believe in one person, one vote. I believe we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. And let me say this. On our first day, first day that we were out, we asked people, to get involved in our campaign. 100,000 people signed up, 35,000 people made donations to berniesanders.com, and we raised on that first day $1.5 million. And you know what the average contribution was? What was it? $43. Nobody thought that I would be elected mayor of Burlington, Vermont. Uh, very few people thought that I would beat an incumbent Republican to become United States congressman from Vermont by 16 points. And people weren't so sure I could beat the richest person in Vermont to become a United States senator. So I would say, don't underestimate me. Don't underestimate this man, Bernie Sanders. The Vermont senator is electrifying Democrats around the country. That this nation and our government belong to all of us and not just a handful of billionaires. After packing Minnesota rallies and surging in Wisconsin straw polls, one organizer sent a warning to the Hillary Clinton camp. Objects in your rear view mirror are closer than they appear. People traveled from across Colorado to hear what they call a true candidate for the people. Uh, I think he's honest, and we don't have that. Ernie. <laughs> Good to see you smile. You know, you're always so serious, which is great, because we want a serious guy, but you deserve a smile. You're a rock star now, you know? You, and, and, you know, you got into this. Everybody said it was just a boutique campaign. You're in New Hampshire. You're within 10 points of Hillary. You're drawing such big crowds, they have to change the venues. Uh, You've already got Hillary Clinton talking like Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing you're going to say it's because you have the right message. <laughs> Look, what the campaign is about is a very radical idea. We're going to tell the truth. <laughs> One of the problems that I always have with this is when we tell the American people what is actually in the budget. They say, no, you're being partisan, you're not being real, this can't be true. 
And the media sometimes says, this is so absurd, we, we don't, we're not even going to discuss the stuff. So let's talk about what really is in the budget. And if my Republican friends disagree with me, I hope they'll come out on the floor and tell us where we're wrong. Right now, the United States is the only country in the industrialized world that doesn't guarantee health care to all people. In the last number of years, we have made some progress in providing health care to many millions of Americans. So what does the Republican budget do? The Republican budget eliminates the Affordable Care Act. That tosses 16 million Americans off of health care. 16 million. But apparently that is not enough. The Republican budget makes massive cuts, over $400 billion in Medicaid, throws another 11 million Americans off of health insurance. 16 plus 11 equals 27 million Americans suddenly thrown off of health insurance. Is there anybody in the United States of America who thinks that this makes any sense at all to throw 27 million Americans off of health insurance? Well, that is exactly what the Republican budget does. In the state of Vermont, and I expect every state represented here, young people are struggling to figure out a way they can afford to go to college. Huge problem. And for those young people who graduate college, they are stuck with these oppressive debts around their neck, which they carry for decades, for decades. The Republican budget responds to this crisis, this is true, by eliminate, cutting pe mandatory Pell Grants by almost $90 billion over a 10-year period, increasing the cost of college education for more than 8 million Americans. That's their response to the crisis of higher education. Tragically, in this country, we have over 40 million people living in poverty. Many of them are struggling to figure out how we put food on the table, how they're going to feed their kids. Republican budget makes massive cuts in nutrition programs for some of the poorest people in this country, increasing hunger. Those are the priorities in the Republican budget. But there is one area where they have been very sacred and consistent about, is that while millions of people are struggling with health care, with education, putting food on the table, the wealthiest people and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. And the Republicans have been absolutely consistent, almost with a religious belief. They will not ask the billionaires, they will not ask profitable corporations to pay one nickel more in taxes. Their intention is to balance the budget on the backs of the elderly, the children, the sick, and the poor. Needless to say, our view of what the American people want and what the American people need is a very different view. Our view is to say that we are on the side of the middle class, we are on the side of working families, and we do believe that when the rich get much richer and corporations in some cases pay zero in federal income tax, yes, they are going to have to pay a little bit more. It seems to me that the least that we can do as a nation, a nation which has more income and wealth inequality than any other major country on earth, a nation in which the wealthiest people are becoming phenomenally richer, while we have over 40 million people living in poverty, the very least that we could say is that nobody in America goes hungry. That, I would hope, would be the least that we could say is a, in a civilized democratic society. Sanders tells ABC News he is in. And in Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont running for president. Earlier today, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders officially announced that he will run as a Democrat for the president of the United States. We now have a political situation where billionaires are literally able to buy elections and candidates. Let's not kid ourselves. They want to end Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, more tax breaks for the rich and large corporations. Nobody in America wants that except the billionaire class. And yet they are now able to put hundreds of millions of dollars into the political process. A great nation will not survive, in my view, when so few have so much and so many have so little. He has a set of consistent principles that he has run on his entire political life. I think Americans love authenticity and they think there's not a lot of it in politics today. And Bernie Sanders, like him or not, is authentic. 
Let's say this about Bernie Sanders. He is the rarest of commodities in Washington, D.C. He is truly an honest man. I've never run a negative ad in my life. I've been in many campaigns, and you ask the people of Vermont, they will tell you Bernie Sanders has never run a negative ad. I hate and detest these 30-second ugly negative ads. Obviously, we have to be strong in protecting our people from uh, terrorism, uh, but I don't think we have to undermine the Constitution and deny our people basic constitutional rights. I think what we have got to appreciate is when you have six financial institutions that have assets equivalent to about 60% of the GDP of America. You know what? Let's be honest. You can't regulate them. You'd break up the banks. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are too, if they're too big to fail, they are too big to exist. Middle class is collapsing, poverty is up, and the rich are doing phenomenally well. What do you do? What you do is say that in America, we're going to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. And by doing that, we're going to create millions of right, jobs. Geez. We've got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage and over a period of years to at least $15 an hour. We as a nation are the only country in the industrialized world not to guarantee health care. 45,000 people die each year because they don't get to a doctor on time, which is why, by the way, I am a strong advocate of a Medicare for all single payer program. Quality education in America, from child care to higher education, must be affordable for all. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders surprised everybody by raising more than one and a half million dollars in the first 24 hours after he announced. You have 100,000 people who have pledged to volunteer on the campaign already? No, actually, we have 175,000. <laughs> All over this country, you have a lot of bright, decent, good people. They're saying, you know what? The situation is hopeless. You can't beat the Koch brothers. You can't beat the billionaires. You can't win. I'm giving up. That is exactly what they want us to believe. And I beg of you, do not enter that world of despair. We can win this fight if we stand together. What history tells us is when people stand together and they have the courage to fight back, and when at this moment people stand up and they say, you know what, this country and our government belong to all of us. Enough is enough. The billionaire class can't have it all. And when we do that, we win. It, it, is not, it is really not me, I don't mean to be humble and meek here, but it is not me, it is you. It is millions of people. And the question is, at a time when we have a grotesque level of income and wealth inequality, at a time when the billionaire class is now buying our political institutions, are we prepared to say enough is enough, the greed has got the end? The struggle that we're in now is not just about protecting Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or making college affordable to our kids or raising the minimum wage. It is something deeper than that. It is about whether we can put together a vibrant grassroots movement all over this country which says to the billionaire class, sorry, Government in this country is going to work for all of us and not just the top 1%. It is essential, Sanders said, to have someone in the 2016 presidential campaign who is willing to take on Wall Street, address the collapse of the middle class, tackle the spread of poverty, and fiercely oppose cuts to Social Security and Medicare. I know that the middle class of this country is collapsing. I know that the gap between the very, very rich and everybody else is growing wider. I know there is profound anger at the greed on Wall Street and corporate America, anger at the political establishment, anger, by the way, at the media establishment. Right. The American people want real change, and I've been taking on the big money interest and the special interest all of my political life. The question is, at a time when so many people have seen a decline in their standard of living, mm -hmm. when the wealthiest people and largest corporations are doing phenomenally well, the American people want change. They want candidates to stand up to the big money interest. The only way we bring about change is when the American people become mobilized. In this coming election, you know mm -hmm. what? 60% of the American people are not going to vote. The Koch okay. brothers 
and the other billionaires are going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. So you know what their agenda is? You know what they believe in? Let me tell you what they believe in. This is what they told us. They want to end Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, more tax breaks for the rich and large corporations. Nobody in America wants that except the billionaire class. And yet they are now able to put hundreds of millions of dollars into the political process. This is a real danger to American democracy. Uh, first of all, real unemployment in this country is not 5.4 percent. That's the official unemployment. If you include those people who have given up looking for work. Or who are underemployed. Exactly. You know what the real number is? It's 11 percent, close to 11 percent. At one point it was 17 percent. Yes, you're right. It's gone down. That's exactly right. Youth unemployment, 17 percent. African-American youth unemployment off the charts. What do we need? We need a major federal jobs program to put people back to work. And that should be about rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our rail system, airports, water systems, wastewater plants. You do that, I've proposed spending a trillion dollars would create 13 million jobs over a five-year period. Number two, you raise the minimum wage to a living wage, not seven and a quarter an hour, but $15 an hour over a period of a few years. Number three, pay equity for women workers. Women should not be making 78 cents on the dollar compared to men. Number four, we have everybody in America. If you're a worker getting paid sick leave, and we also have to move toward paid vacation time. I think that there are millions and millions of people who are tired of establishment politics, who are tired of corporate greed, who want a candidate to help lead a mass movement in this country of millions of people who essentially say, what people are saying is enough is enough. The billionaire class cannot have it all. The American people understand that when you have an economy where 99% of all new income goes to the top one percent, and where the top one tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90%, where one family, the Walton family itself, owns more wealth than the bottom 130 million Americans, that is not an economy that America is supposed to have. That's not what we are about. And people want change. They want the wealthy and the powerful to start paying their fair share of taxes. We have large profitable corporations, Katie, that are not paying a nickel in federal income tax now. That's totally absurd. What we will do also is impose a uh, transfer, a stock transfer fee on Wall Street speculation, which can raise a very substantial amount of money. What I believe is that given the greed and recklessness and illegal, illegal behavior on Wall Street, where you have six financial institutions that have assets that are the equivalent of 60% of the gross domestic product of this country, who have caused the worst recession in the modern history of this country. Many of these banks are bigger today than they were before we bailed them out. Enough is enough. On top of all of that, one of the real tragedies of our moment is that we have hundreds of thousands of young people in this country at a moment when we are living in a highly competitive global economy who cannot afford to go to college, and you've got millions more who are graduating deeply in debt. This has got to be dealt with. In fact, I know that you've introduced legislation to make college tuition free at public for universities. Public colleges and universities. Across the countries. But, but how do you pay for that? I'll tell you how you pay for it. You pay for it exactly what I said a moment ago, on a tax on Wall Street speculation. Right now, there is huge amounts of speculation going on on Wall Street, a whole lot of stock transfer. We can raise something like $300 billion a year and also have the additional impact of putting a damper on that speculation. The people of this country bailed out Wall Street. Now it is time for Wall Street to start helping the middle class of this country. In terms of student debt, you literally have millions of people, no longer young people, middle-aged people, who are paying 7, 8, 9 percent on their student debt. That is pretty crazy. So if we want to be competitive in the global economy, we do need to go back to where we were 45, 50 years ago. Do you know how much it cost to go to the City University of New York 50 years ago? It was free. University of California, free. Today, unaffordable. So I don't know if I'm a conservative or a progressive, but I want to go back to those days. As mayor of the city of Berlin, as a member of Congress, as a member of the Senate, I have stood up to the most powerful people, the most powerful special interest in this country. I, was, I took on Wall Street, and I am fighting to see that we break up the large financial institutions. I took on the insurance companies. I've taken on the drug companies. I've taken on the military-industrial complex. I am fighting to make sure that every kid in this country, regardless of his or her income, can afford to go to college. My view is that the only way we can bring about an agenda that works for working families is when millions of people are actively involved in the political process. If a million young people march on Washington, 
They say to the Republican leadership, we know what's going on, and you'd better vote to deal with student debt. You'd better vote to make public universities and colleges tuition free. That's when it will happen. We're already seeing that with the minimum wage. You know why minimum wage is going up around the country? Because workers are going out into the street. So we need a political revolution, in my view, where people begin to stand up and fight and take on the big money interest. If we don't have that, no president, not the best president in the world, will ever be able to accomplish anything. Because the powers in Washington are just, they have too much money and they're just too powerful. I, it's interesting. I always find that politicians are in trouble whenever they say our country uh, should, should emulate other countries. I feel like there's this idea that America, uh, certainly when you talk about politics, you have to frame us as we do everything perfectly. Is it dangerous? How hard is it to say we should, in this field, we should be more Look, like I think countries? we've got to be honest. There are a lot of things that we do very, very well. But there are things that we do not do particularly well. Are we happy that 99% of all new income is going to the top 1%? Are we happy that one family in this country owns more wealth than the bottom 130 million people? Are we happy that we have a campaign finance system now through Citizens United that allows billionaires to buy elections? Are we happy that we are not fighting effectively against climate change? So I think smart people look around the world and they say, look, this is what we are doing well, but this is what other countries are doing well. And I think we should learn and not be afraid to emulate the good things that are going on in other countries. Now you are, some have, some have tried to frame you as this fringe candidate, but a lot of the things you believe are things that uh, the majority of Americans believe. You know, you've talked about uh, raising the minimum wage to $15. You've talked about uh, making college education uh, free for everybody. How, public, public college Public education. college education. Yeah. How, would you, uh, how would you pay for that? Good question. And the answer is, that in the, at a time when we have massive income and wealth inequality, we have got to ask the wealthiest people and largest corporations to start paying their fair share of taxes. It's simple as all that. Uh, right now, we are losing over $100 billion every year because profitable corporations are stashing their profits uh, in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda and other uh, tax havens. Uh, you got a guy like Warren Buffett, one of the richest guys in the world, who openly admits that his effective tax rate is lower than his secretaries. So I think it is time to tell the billionaire class that if they want to enjoy the benefits of America, they've got to accept their responsibilities and they have to stop paying their fair share of taxes. Now, you talk about how, you know, all, all the income growth uh, in this country over the last 30 years, uh, so much of it has gone to 1%. Yes. So it seems like it would be a great uh, position as a candidate to talk about something that would benefit the other 99%. Uh, yet this idea of when you say uh, redistribution of wealth, that always gets framed as something uh, that's not only socialist, but you know, some would frame it as being uh, worse than that. Well, Seth, here's the story. In the last 30 years, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth. Unfortunately, it's gone in the wrong direction. What's happened is the middle class has shrunk and trillions of dollars in wealth have gone to the top 1%. So what you have right now is millions of people in this country are working longer hours for low wages. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. And I think we have got to get our act together. And in fact, I do believe that all of that money that has gone from the middle class to the top 1%, I think it should start coming back to the people who need it the most. And here's something, again, not talked about, something that should make us all very, very nervous. Half of all Americans have less than $10,000 in their savings account. Now, do you know what that means? And do you know why people are so stressed out? If you have less than $10,000, that means an automobile accident, a divorce, a serious illness, a crisis of one kind or another can drive you into bankruptcy and financial disaster. So what you have, and you can see it in people's faces all over America, they are scared to death. If you're 55 years of age, you're worried that some 25-year-old kid is going to take your job. If you are a young person who graduated college, you're wondering if you're going to be driving a cab for your whole life. I will relate to you a story that occurred a few years ago, I, I, and I'll never forget this. I met a woman outside of a grocery store in my hometown of Burlington, Vermont. This is what she said. She said, you know, Bernie, I'm working three jobs. 
my husband is working three jobs. We're working at different hours. We have one kid. We would like to have more kids. But we cannot be the kind of parents we want to be. That's going on all over America. To the young people, let me shock you with a statistic here. There was once a time, and the older folks in this room will remember it, radical, crazy idea, where one worker in a family, in those days usually the man, one worker was able to earn enough money to take care of the entire family. Today, all over America, you got mom working, you got dad working, occasionally you have the kids working, and we still don't have enough money to pay the bills. Something is fundamentally wrong about that. This morning I wanted to say a few words on an issue that many of my Republican colleagues talk about, and that is family values. Uh, but I wanted to talk about it in a slightly different manner. Uh, when my Republican colleagues talk about family values, what they are talking about is opposition to a woman's right to choose, opposition to contraception, opposition to gay rights. Uh, let me give a somewhat different perspective on family values, on what real family values are about. Uh, it seems to me that there is no family value stronger than uh, a mother having a baby and having the right to spend weeks and months with her baby. Uh, every psychologist who has studied the issue understands that the most important years of a human being's life are the first weeks and months and years. Uh, and mothers want to spend time with their babies. Fathers want to spend time with their babies. And yet the United States of America is the only major wealthy industrialized country that does not guarantee that right uh, to a mom with the kids. Uh, that is a family value. If there's anything that's a family value, that is one. And that has got to change. The United States has got to join the rest of the industrialized world, and that is why I strongly uh, support legislation um, introduced by Senator Gillibrand, which would allow uh, a 12, le 12 weeks uh, for parental leave uh, so that moms can spend time with their babies and for other uh, health care needs. Second area where the United States falls far behind other countries in a rather absurd way is that uh, we have a situation where people in this country, by the millions, have no uh, guaranteed uh, sick leave. So what that means is that today a worker here in Washington, D.C., or any place around this country is going to work at McDonald's who should not be at work. And especially in areas like the food industry, sick people are handling our food. And the reason for that is that uh, they do not have any paid sick leave. Uh, and what we understand is that um, while uh, larger companies will provide paid sick leave to workers. Many low-income workers do not have that benefit. The United States must join uh, the rest of the world in guaranteeing at least a certain amount of time uh, for paid sick leave, which is why I'm supporting Senator Patty Murray's bill, which does just that. Um, but last but not least, I want to talk about a bill that I'm going to be introducing today, and, and, and it's on an issue that gets almost no discussion at all. And that is that in America today, our people, the American worker, uh, is working longer hours uh, than are the people of any other major industrialized country. Uh, as some of you may remember uh, or have read about, a hundred years ago, there were workers in the street, took to the streets, demanding a 40-hour work week, demanding a 40-hour work week a hundred years ago. And here we are today, living in a country which has seen an explosion of technology, an explosion of productivity, and we still do not have the 40-hour work week. In fact, incredibly, 85 percent of men and 60 percent of working women are working more than 40 hours a week. What we have in my state and around this country are people not working one job, they're working two jobs, occasionally they're working three or four jobs in order to cobble together an income and some health care. And the fact of the matter is 
that Americans now work by far the longest hours of any major country on earth, 137 hours a year more than workers in Japan, who are also very hard workers, 260 hours more than the British, and almost 500 hours a year more than French workers. So we have a situation where, one, because of the disappearing middle class, because wages have gone down, people have got to work longer hours in order to provide, put bread on the table for their families, and yet we are the only major country on earth that does not guarantee paid vacation time. And that is the legislation that I am introducing today. And that legislation would require employers to provide at least 10 days of paid vacation to workers in this country. Clearly, this is already done in almost every country in the world and is one way to demonstrate a serious commitment to family values. Think about what it means to a family when a wife and a husband do not have a block of time, a week, two weeks, to spend with their kids. Uh, so I think we have got to address this issue. Uh, as I go around the country, what I notice is that we are a stressed out nation. People are tired. People are exhausted. People are overworked. People need vacation time. And it is absolutely absurd that nearly one in four workers uh, in this country get no paid vacation time. Uh, and while we have seen uh, some companies do a really good job uh, in understanding the need for paid vacation for their workers that increases morale, increases productivity, that certainly is by no means universal. So um, when we compare ourselves to uh, wealthier countries in Europe, Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, we discover that the United States is the only country that does not require employers to provide at least 10 days of paid vacation time, and that has got to be remedied, that has got to be addressed, and that is exactly what our legislation does. So bottom line here is we need in this country a serious discussion of family values, real family values. And family values are about the ability of a mom to be able to spend time with a newborn baby and not be forced back into the workplace because she doesn't have enough money. Family values are about a mom being able to take care of a sick child and not forcing that kid to go to school when he or she should not be going to school. And lastly, family values are about the ability of a family to spend some leisure time together uh, in, a, in a relaxed environment. But if you really talk about family values, what does family values mean? Can you honestly tell me that it is a va family value, a family value when a woman is forced back to work after giving birth one week after that birth? Is that a family value? Is it a family value when a parent cannot take care of a sick <laughs> child and doesn't have the guarantee and the right to do that? Is it a family value? Talk about family values. When people think back about their lives, you know, what do you think about? You think about the vacation time you spent, moms and dads spent with their kids, and yet you've got millions of workers who have no paid vacation time at all. Those are real family values, and you're right. I intend to appropriate that language to really talk about the family values that matter to the American people. In America today, right now, we have more wealth and income inequality than in any major industrialized nation on earth, and it is worse today than at any time since 1929. Now, one of the moral implications of a situation, I'm talking about morality now, of a situation where the top one tenth of one percent owns more wealth than the bottom 90 percent. What does it mean that one family in America, the Walton family, owns more wealth than the bottom 130 million Americans? What does it mean that in the last two years, the 14 wealthiest people in this country, Gates and Buffett, the Koch brothers and those guys, saw their wealth increase by $157 billion dollars which is more wealth than it is owned by the bottom 40% of Americans. What does it mean that today, millions and millions of people going to work every day, 
99% of all of the new income is going to the top 1% at the same time as we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. What does it mean that for the last 40 years, the middle class of this country has been disappearing and most of the new jobs that have been created pay workers wages that are inadequate and many of these jobs are part-time jobs. Is that the kind of economy that is moral? Is it sustainable? Is that what America is about? So we talk about a lot of things on the floor of the Senate, but somehow we forget to talk about the reality of who is winning in this economy and who is losing. And it is very clear to anyone who spends two minutes studying the issue that the people on top are doing extraordinarily well at the same time as the middle class is collapsing and poverty is increasing. Today, the Wall Street executives, the crooks on Wall Street, whose actions resulted in the severe recession that we are in right now. The people who have, whose actions, illegal actions, reckless actions, have resulted in millions of Americans losing their jobs, their homes, their savings. Guess what? After we bail them out, the CEOs today are now earning more money than they did before the bailout. While the middle class in this country collapses and the rich become much richer, the United States now has by far the most unequal distribution of income and wealth of any major country on earth. When we were in school, we used to read the textbooks which talked about the banana republics in Latin America. We used to read the books about countries in which a handful of people owned and controlled most of the wealth of those countries. Well, guess what? That's exactly what is happening in the United States today. The wealthiest people in this country, not all of them, by the way, not all of them. There are many wealthy people in this country who understand and are proud to be Americans, who understand that one of the things that's important is that all of us do well. But there are, on the other hand, many others whose apparently only concern is more and more wealth and more and more power for themselves. And this is an issue, this greed is an issue that we have got to deal with. And if you can believe it, we have people here, many of my Republican colleagues, who tell us, oh, I am so concerned about our record-breaking deficit, but we are more concerned that millionaires, people who earn at least a million dollars a year or more, get on average $100,000 a year in tax breaks. You've got growing income inequality, top 1%, earning more income than the bottom 50%, but the highest priority of many of my Republican colleagues is to make sure that millionaires and billionaires get more tax breaks. I think that that is absurd. But it is not only income tax rates that we're dealing with. It is the estate tax as well. And let's be clear, while some of my friends want to eliminate completely the estate tax, which has been in existence in this country since 1916, let us be clear that every nickel of benefit, all of those benefits, will go to the top three-tenths of one percent. And if we did, as some of my friends would like, eliminate the estate tax completely, it would cost us a trillion dollars in revenue over a 10-year period, all of the benefits going to the top three-tenths for one percent. So I am sure that in a little while my friends are going to come down to the floor and say, we're very concerned about the deficit, we're very concerned about the national debt, but you know what we're more concerned about? Giving huge tax breaks to the wealthiest people in this country. The tax issue is just one part of what some of our wealthy friends want to see happen in this country. The reality is that many of these folks want to bring the United States back to where we were in the 1920s. And they want to do their best to eliminate all traces 
of social legislation which working families fought tooth and nail to develop to bring a modicum of stability and security to their lives. There are people out there, not all, but there are some who want to privatize or completely eliminate social security. They want to privatize or cut back substantially on Medicare. Yeah, if you're 75 years of age and you have no money, good luck to you getting your health insurance at an affordable cost from a private insurance company. I am just sure there are all kinds of private insurance companies out there just delighted to take care of low-income seniors who are struggling with cancer or another disease. There are corporate leaders out there and many members of Congress who not only want to continue, they want to expand our disastrous trade policies. My wife and I went shopping the other day, started our Christmas shopping, and we looked and we looked at virtually every product that was out there in the store, consumer products, was China, China, and China. We seem to be a country in which we have a 51st state named China, which is producing virtually all of the products that we as Americans consume. Our trade policy has resulted in the loss of millions of good paying jobs as large corporations and CEOs have said, why do I want to reinvest in America when I can go to countries where people are paid 50 cents, 75 cents an hour? That's what I'm going to do, to act with the working people of this country. So not only are we saddled with this disastrous trade policy, there are people who actually want to expand it. Now, one of the things that we're going to see going on is that while we struggle with a record-breaking deficit and a large national debt caused by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, caused by tax breaks for the wealthy, caused by an unpaid-for Medicare Part D prescription drug program, caused by the Wall Street bailout, driving up the deficit, driving up the national debt, that some people can say, oh my goodness, we got all of those expenses, and then we got to give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires, but we want to balance the budget. Gee, how are we going to do that? Well, obviously, we know how they're going to do that. We're going to cut back on health care. We're going to cut back on education. We're going to cut back on child care. We're going to cut back on Pell programs. We just don't have enough money for working families and their needs. We're going to cut back on food stamps. We're surely not going to expand unemployment compensation. we got a higher priority, Mr. President. We have got to, got to, got to give tax breaks to billionaires. I mean, that's what this whole place is about, isn't it? They fund the campaigns. They get what's due them. Mr. President, amazingly enough, we have our friends on Wall Street, the CEOs of the large financial institutions. They want to rescind or slow down many of the provisions, the very modest provisions in the financial reform bill. I voted for the financial reform bill, but I will tell you clearly it did not go anywhere near far enough, but it went too far for our Wall Street friends and their lobbyists who are all over here. And for the hundreds of millions of dollars Wall Street spends in this place, they want to rescind, slow down some of the reforms there. These people want to cut back on the powers of the EPA and the Department of Energy so that ExxonMobil can remain the most profitable corporation in world history while oil and coal companies continue to pollute our air and our water. Last year, ExxonMobil made $19 billion in profit. Guess what? They paid zero in taxes. They got a $156 million refund from the IRS. I guess that's not good enough. We've got to give the oil companies even more tax breaks. So, Mr. President, I think that's where we are. We've got to own up to it. There is a war going on. The middle class is struggling for existence, and they're taking on some of the wealthiest and most powerful forces in the world whose greed has no end. And if we don't begin to stand together and start representing those families, there will not be a middle class in this country. On Saturday, 
just this last Saturday, I had been invited to speak in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and my friend and I were driving back to D.C., and we drove through Gettysburg, uh, and we stopped there for a while at the uh, battle, battlefield uh, monuments and the museum. And while we were there, uh, we, of course, saw the, the uh, Lincoln uh, statues, and uh, we read from his Gettysburg Address. And you all know about Lincoln's extraordinary uh, Gettysburg Address. He said of a hope that this nation would have, quote, a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, end of quote. What an extraordinary statement. And as we drove back from Gettysburg to Washington, it struck me hard that Lincoln's extraordinary vision, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, was in fact perishing, was coming to an end, and that we are moving rapidly away from our democratic heritage into an oligarchic form of society, where today we are experiencing a government of the billionaires, by the billionaires, and for the billionaires. Today, in my view, the most serious problem we face as a nation is the grotesque and growing level of wealth and income inequality. This is a profound moral issue, it is an economic issue, and it is a political issue. Where do we go? What should we be doing? How do we rebuild the disappearing middle class and create an economy that works for all of our people? Last month, I introduced a 12-point program which I called an Agenda for America. It's available on my website, sanders.senate.gov, but let me very briefly summarize it. First of all, you ask the average American what the most important issue he or she is concerned about, and the answer is a four-letter word. It's called jobs. We need a major federal jobs program to put millions of Americans back to work. The fastest way to do that is to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, our roads, bridges, water systems, wastewater plants, airports, railroads, and schools. It has been estimated that the cost of the Bush-Cheney-Iraq war a war we should never have waged will total $3 trillion by the time the last veteran receives needed care. A $1 trillion investment in infrastructure could support 13 million decent-paying jobs and make our country more efficient, productive, and safer. And along with Senator Barbara Mikulski, I introduced that legislation two weeks ago. Further, we must understand that climate change is real, it is caused by human activity, and it is already causing devastating harm. We must listen to the scientific community and not Fox TV and lead the world in reversing climate change so that this planet is habitable for our children and grandchildren. And what that means, and we have the technology to do it, transform our system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency, weatherization, and sustainable energies like wind, solar, geothermal, and other technologies. And when we do that, we not only lead the world in reversing climate change, we can also create many jobs. We not only need to create jobs in this country, we need to raise wages. The current federal minimum wage of seven and a quarter an hour is a starvation wage. We need to raise the minimum wage over a period of years to at least $15 an hour. No one who works 40 hours a week in this country should live in poverty. We must also demand pay equity for women workers who today earn 78 cents of what their male counterparts make for doing the same work. We must also end the scandal of overtime pay. We have people at McDonald's who make $25,000 a year as quote-unquote managers who work 50 or 60 hours a week, but because they are quote-unquote managers, they don't get overtime. Further, we make, must make it easier for workers to join unions by passing card check legislation. We need to take a hard look at our trade policies. 
which have resulted in the outsourcing of millions of good-paying jobs. I think the evidence is overwhelming. NAFTA, CAFTA, PNTR with China have failed. It makes no sense to me to continue a failed policy which leads us to a race to the bottom. We need new trade policies. We need to demand that corporate America start investing in this country and not in China. Banking plays an important role, obviously, in our society. And in that, I am pretty conservative. What banking is about, traditional banking is, I work, I make money, I put it in the bank. I get a guaranteed interest rate. The bank then invests money into the economy. What has happened in recent years is something radically different. Wall Street, instead of being the grease for the economy, taking money in and getting it out to small businesses, medium-sized businesses, what Wall Street has become is an island unto itself where its goal is to make as much money as it can in however way that it can do it. And I don't want to, uh, again, you know, try to be you know, too dramatic here. I happen to believe that the business model of Wall Street is fraud and deception. And as you know, recently you pick up the papers every single day, there's another large bank that is fined, uh, reaches a settlement with the government. So their job is banking plays an important role. It helps get money out to the economy, the businesses that are producing products, producing services. That is what we want from a banking, the banking community. We don't want a small number of people coming up with incredibly complicated, speculative, dangerous financial tools. And then when it all goes down, the taxpayers of this country bail them out. That is what we don't want. In my view, it is time to break up the largest financial institutions in this country. Wall Street cannot be an island unto itself, gambling trillions in risky financial instruments while expecting the public to bail it out. If a bank is too big to fail, that bank is too big to exist. The function of banking should be boring. Boring. The function of banking should not be about making as much profits as possible, gambling on derivatives and other esoteric financial institutions. The function of banking should be to provide affordable loans to small and medium-sized businesses in the productive economy. The function of banking should be to provide affordable loans to Americans who need to purchase homes and cause. Wall Street cannot be an island unto itself, separate from the productive economy whose only goal is to make as much money as they can. As we all know, the greed, recklessness, and illegal behavior on Wall Street drove this country into the worst recession since the Great Depression. Millions of Americans lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost their life savings, lost their ability to send their kids to college. The middle class is still suffering from the horrendous damage huge financial institutions and insurance companies did to them in 2008. I voted for the Dodd-Frank legislation, but let us not kid ourselves. Dodd-Frank was a modest piece of legislation. Dodd-Frank did not end much of the casino-style gambling that takes place on Wall Street. In fact, much of this reckless activity is still going on today. It seems like almost every day we read about one giant financial institution after another being fined or reaching settlements for their reckless, unfair, and deceptive activities. Can't pick up a paper without reading about one scandal after another. In fact, since 2009, Huge financial institutions have paid $176 billion in fines and settlement payments for fraudulent and unscrupulous activities. Bank of America has paid over $57 billion. J.P. Morgan has paid over $31 billion. And Citigroup has paid over $12 billion in fines and settlements. 
Bank of America has been fined for foreclosure abuses, selling toxic mortgage-backed securities, LIBOR manipulation, and currency rigging, among other things. It should make every American extremely nervous that in this weak regulatory environment, weak regulatory environment, the financial supervisors in our country and around the world are still able to uncover an enormous amount of fraud on Wall Street and other financial institutions to this very day. I fear very much that the financial system is even more fragile than many people may perceive. This huge issue simply cannot be swept under the rug. It has got to be addressed. During the financial crisis of 2008, the American people were told that they needed to bail out huge financial institutions because they were too big to fail. Yet today, three out of the four financial institutions, three out of the four largest financial institutions in this country, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo, are 80 percent larger than they were on September 30th, 2007, a year before the taxpayers of this country bailed them out. So we bailed out the largest financial institutions in this country because they were too big to fail, and today three out of the four largest are now much, much larger than they were when we bailed them out. Incredibly, during that time, J.P. Morgan Chase has increased its assets by more than a trillion dollars, Bank of America by more than $500 billion, and Wells, after Wells Fargo acquired Wachovia, it has more than tripled its size. In other words, if any of these financial institutions were to fail again, the taxpayers of this country would be on the hook for another bailout, perhaps even larger than the last one. We must not allow that to happen. No single financial institution should be so large that its failure would cause catastrophic risk to millions of Americans or to our nation's economic well-being. No single financial institution should have holdings so extensive that its failure would send the world economy into crisis. If an institution is too big to fail, it is too big to exist, and that is the bottom line. And let's be clear, the reason we are here today is not just because of the danger these institutions pose to taxpayers. That unto itself is an enormous issue. But there is another issue as well. The enormous concentration of ownership within the financial sector is hurting the middle class and damaging the economy by limiting choices and raising prices for consumers and small businesses. Today, just six large financial institutions have assets of nearly $10 trillion, and that is equivalent to nearly 60% of the GDP of our nation. These huge banks handle more than two-thirds of all credit card purchases, write over 35% of the mortgages, and control nearly half of all bank deposits in this country. That simply is too much concentration of owner ownership and too much power. If the American people are wondering why tens of millions of Americans are being charged interest rates of more than 20 percent on their credit cards, more than 20 percent on their credit cards, while big, while big banks can receive virtually zero interest loans from the Fed, the lack of competition in the banking industry is a major reason for that. If Teddy Roosevelt were alive today, I think I know what he would say. And what he would say is, these financial institutions are simply too big. We have got to break them up, and he would be right. The bill that I am introducing today with Congressman Brad Sherman would require regulators at the Financial Stability Oversight Council to establish too big to fail list, a too big to fail list of financial institutions and other huge entities whose failure would pose a catastrophic risk on the United States economy without a taxpayer bailout. This list must include, but is not limited to, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and Morgan Stanley. All of these financial institutions have already been deemed systemically important banks 
by the Financial Stability Board, the G20 body that monitors and makes recommendations about the global financial system. Within a year, the Treasury Secretary would be required to break up financial institutions on this list so that they cannot cause another financial crisis. Importantly, under this bill, none of the institutions on the Too Big to Fail list would be able to receive a taxpayer bailout from the Federal Reserve, nor could they gamble with the federally insured bank deposits of the American people while they are on that list. For me, this position that I'm holding today is not new. In 1994, I cast the only no vote on the House Financial Services Committee against legislation that allowed large out-of-state banks to acquire locally owned community banks. In 1999, I helped lead the opposition against repealing Glass-Steagall that allowed commercial banks, insurance companies, and investment banks to merge. And I was one of the leading opponents of the efforts of Alan Greenspan, Robert Rubin, and Larry Summers, who all told us how wonderful it would be if we deregulated Wall Street back in the 1990s. Mr. Greenspan, I have long been concerned that you are way out of touch with the needs of the middle class and working families of our country, that you see your major function in your position as the need to represent the wealthy and large corporations. And I must tell you that your testimony today only con confirms all of my suspicions. And I urge you, and I mean this seriously, because you're an honest person. I think you just don't know what's going on in the real world. And I would urge you, come with me to Vermont, meet real people. The country clubs and the cocktail parties are not real America. The millionaires and billionaires are the exception to the rule. You talk about an improving economy while we have lost three million private sector jobs in the last two years. Long-term unemployment has more than tripled. Unemployment is higher than it has been since 1994. We have a $4 trillion national debt. 1.4 million Americans have lost their health insurance. Millions of seniors can't afford prescription drugs. Middle class families can't send their kids to college because they don't have the money to do that. Bankruptcy, bankruptcy cases have increased by a record breaking 23%. Business investment is at its lowest level in more than 50 years. CEOs make more than 500 times of what their workers make. The middle class is shrinking. We have the greatest gap between the rich and the poor of any industrialized nation, and this is an economy that is improving. I hate to see what would happen if our economy was sinking. Now today, you may not have known this. I suspect that you don't, but you have insulted tens of millions of American workers. You have defended over the years, among other things, the abolition of the minimum wage, one of your policies, and giving huge tax breaks to billionaires. But today you reached a new low, I think, by suggesting that manufacturing in America doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where the product is produced. We lost two million manufacturing jobs in the last two years alone, 10% of our workforce. Walmart has replaced General Motors as the major employer in America paying people starvation wages rather than living wages and all of that does not matter to you doesn't matter if it's produced in china where workers are making 30 cents an hour or produced in vermont where workers can make 20 bucks an hour it doesn't matter you have told the american people that you support a trade policy which is selling them out only working for the ceos who can take our plants to china mexico and india you insulted mr castle mr castle a few moments ago a good republican told you that we're seeing not only the decline of manufacturing jobs, but white collar information technology jobs. Forrester Research says that over the next 15 years, 3.3 million US service industry jobs and 136 billion in wages will move offshore to India, Russia, China, and the Philippines. Does any of this matter to you? Do you give one whit of concern to the middle class and working families of this country? 
You want to expand Social Security, yes. but recently uh, Chris Christie has talked about means testing yes. for Social Security recipients and, and raising the age of eligibility yes. from 65 to yes. 69. So you're talking about expanding Social yes. Security, and I know you don't believe that it's, it's in trouble. You've said that before, the Here's Social the Security. Go ahead. It's not a, not a debate. Yes, Jeb Bush recently came out with more or less the same idea as Chris Christie. Here's the fact. Social Security has over $2.5 trillion in the trust fund. No one debates this. It can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 18 years. But as, as the population ages and fewer young workers are contributing to the, to the system, it's not going to be a problem in your view? Well, we've got 18 years, so it's not in crisis right now. And the other dishonesty that's out there is it's causing a deficit problem, which it's not. Obviously, it's paid independently by the payroll tax. But what do you think of means testing? Well, I don't. I think it should be a universal system. When you talk to these guys, it's not just billionaires they don't want on the system. What they, you know, some it may be coming down to forty or fifty thousand dollars a year to start cutting benefits. Here's my view: If you want to make Social Security, and I've introduced legislation to do this, if you want to make extend the life of Social Security for decades, and to expand benefits, you know what you do. Right now, person A is making ten million a year. Person B is making one hundred eighteen thousand dollars a year. Both of them are paying the same exact of money into the amount of money into the Social Security Trust Fund. Lift that cap, and you don't even have to start at 118. Start at 250,000. You will have enough money to extend Social Security for decades and also expand benefits. There are many people in this country, Katie. We don't know. A lot of people don't know this. You had elderly people trying to get by on twelve, thirteen thousand dollars a year. In my view, we need to expand benefits. Now that Jeb Bush or Chris Christie or all these. Republicans representing billionaires, they come forward and they say to working people, you're going to have to work to 67, 68, 70 years of age. I think that that is very cruel and I think it's unnecessary and I will vigorously oppose that. There is no question in my mind, and I think the minds of most Americans, that what our trade policy has been for many years is to allow corporate America to shut down plants in this country, move abroad, hire people at pennies an hour, and then bring their products back into the United States. Our nation, and this is an untold secret, is becoming a poorer and poorer nation. Our working people in the last 20 years have seen a significant decline in their standard of living because our nation has turned from a manufacturing economy into a service economy industry economy, which is paying our workers extremely low wages. One of the reasons that our standard of living is declining is that major American corporations like General Motors, General Electric, and many others have thrown hundreds of thousands of American workers out on the street as they run to Mexico and to Asia to hire desperate workers there and pay them starvation wages. We do not need a fast-track agreement. We need a new industrial policy which provides good-paying jobs for our workers. Thank you. When you ask the American people what is the most important issue on their minds, they always respond, in every poll that I have seen, with a four-letter word, J-O-B-S jobs. Now why is that? The papers tell you that real, that official unemployment in this country is 5.4%. But that is not what real unemployment is according to other government statistics. If you include those people who have given up looking for work, discouraged workers, if you include those people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time, and a lot of the new jobs being created are part-time jobs, do you know what real unemployment is in America today? It's close to 11%. Do you know what youth unemployment is in America today? 17%. We never talk about it. I can't remember almost anybody in Congress even raising that issue. Do you know what African American youth unemployment is? It is off the charts. It is off the charts. There are communities in this country where 50% of the African American young people are unemployed. So if we are serious about rebuilding this crumbling middle class of ours, we have got to have a federal jobs program which creates millions of people.
our infrastructure is crumbling and it's time to rebuild it. The American Society of Civil Engineers, the guys who know something about this, tell us that we need to spend over three trillion dollars to rebuild our roads, our bridges, our water systems, our wastewater plants, our airports, airports. We need an enormous amount of work on rail. We're behind Europe, Japan, China on rail. We need to repair and rebuild our levees and our dams. And when you do that, when you make that investment, you make America more productive, you make America more efficient, we make our country safer, and we can create with a trillion dollar investment up to 13 million decent paying jobs. And that's exactly what we have to do. I'll tell you programs, EJ, that have not worked, and that is trickle-down economics. Uh, trickle-down economics, which means tax breaks for the rich and large corporations, deregulation of Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera, has been a grotesque failure. Any, e any economic analysis will suggest that that is true. At a time when 35 million Americans have no health insurance, the Republican solution to that problem is an extremely interesting one. They say, let's end the Affordable Care Act and cut Medicaid by over $400 billion, the result of which will be to throw another 27 million Americans off of health insurance. That's their solution to the health care crisis. And when you say to them, and I do, and I know these guys very well, I sit on the same debate, known them for years, and you say, tell me, what happens when you throw 27 million people off of health insurance, many of whom just received insurance fairly recently? How many of them will die? How many of them will become much sicker than they would have had to be? How many of them will suffer? What happens to the children who will lose their health insurance? They have no answer. They have no answer. Because that is not an issue that they are concerned about. What has happened in the last 30 years is there has been a huge transfer of wealth from the middle class and the working families of this country not only to the top 1%, but to the top one-tenth of 1%. One and our job is to transfer that wealth back down again to the middle class and the working class. For most Americans, the economic reality of today is pretty clear. Uh, for the last 40 years, the American middle class has been disappearing while the people on top, the wealthiest people, have uh, been doing better and better and better. Corporate profits are soaring, and CEOs now earn over 270 times what their average employee makes. And today, we are going to hear testimony from our Republican friends, invited witnesses that I can only refer to, their testimony, as the Robin Hood principle in reverse. We're going to hear from witnesses who suggest that in the midst of this massive income and wealth inequality, that we cut programs that the elderly, the children, the sick, the poor, and working families desperately depend upon. And then at the same time, they want us to give more tax breaks to the rich and large corporations. And unless I am very mistaken, and if I am, I owe you an apology, Mr. Chairman. That is exactly what the Republican budget will be doing, taking from the working people and the poor and giving to the wealthy and large corporations. And that is exactly what the Ryan budget did last year when it was passed by the Republican House. Further, we will hear testimony today from one of our Republican witnesses about the need to make major cuts in Social Security and Medicare. In other words, not only do some of my Republican colleagues want to provide huge tax breaks for the wealthy, not only do they want to make cuts in health care, nutrition, education, heating assistance, food stamps, meals on wheels, and affordable housing, they also want to cut Social Security benefits for elderly seniors in Vermont and throughout this country struggling to survive on 14 
or $15,000 a year or less. And by the way, also cut back on benefits for disabled veterans. That is wrong. That is terribly wrong. Frankly, it is almost laughable that this advice to cut Social Security and Medicare comes from the Business Roundtable, an organization representing the CEOs of many of the largest corporations and Wall Street financial institutions in this country. While these people tell us that we should cut Social Security for a senior in Vermont who today doesn't have the funds to heat her home or pay for a medicine, a study from the Institute for Policy Studies tells us that the CEOs of these major corporations in the Business Roundtable can expect a monthly retirement check of $88,576 a month. So we have people who are getting a retirement benefit of over $88,000 a month coming here telling us that we should cut Social Security benefits for elderly people in Vermont who are trying to live on $14,000 a year. I thank you for your advice, but that is advice that this senator will not accept. These people have destroyed millions of lives because of their greed and recklessness. I will take them on, and we're going to rebuild an economy so that it works for all people and not just the very wealthy. We would have to put together the strongest grassroots movement in the modern history of this country, where millions of people are saying, you know what, enough is enough. We are going to take on the billionaire class. We are going to have a government that starts working for working families rather than just the top 1%. And to be honest with you, I mean, I, go, I am going around the country was, uh, and talking to a lot of people. We've got a lot of people coming out. There is a lot of sentiment that enough is enough, that we need fundamental changes, that the establishment, whether it is the economic establishment, the political establishment, or the media establishment, is failing the American people. I, I, you know, I was just thinking the other day, this is how absurd the situation is. If you had a candidate, me or anybody else, who really reached out and generated a lot of excitement, and you had two million people say, you know what, we're going to put a hundred bucks into the campaign. And by the way, in my Senate race, you know what my average contribution was, EJ, was $45. All right? So if you had two million people, phenomenal response, putting in a hundred bucks, that's $200 million. That is 20% of what the Koch brothers themselves are prepared to spend. Can you take that on? I don't know the answer. Maybe the game is over. Maybe they have bought the United States government. Maybe there is no turning back. Maybe we've gone over the edge. I don't know. I surely hope not. But we have to look at that reality. You were looking at a candidate who ran four times for mayor, eight times for the House, and twice for the Senate. EJ, do you know how many negative ads I've run during that whole period? Zero. Never ran a negative ad in my life. Because negative ads disgust me, and in fact, in my state, they don't work. It is not my style to trash people. Uh, it is not my style to run ugly negative ads. Never have. Never will. If you have nothing real to say, how are you going to get votes? Are you going to see a 30-second ad which says, vote for me so I can give tax breaks to billionaires? Right. Probably not. <laughs> are you going to say, vote for me because I don't think global warming is a real problem? <laughs> Probably not going to get too many votes. That's a so bad you, campaign. So what do you do? It's the same. It's racism. It's homophobia. Government is going right. to take away every gun and, in America. And, it, and all of there. there is hate out there, and it's often among white guys. And you know why they're angry? They're angry because they're working really hard, and their standard of living is going down. They're working really hard, and the world is passing them by. And they're not. They don't understand why. And instead of getting angry at the big money interest who are sending their jobs abroad or taking away their health insurance or giving tax breaks to people who don't need it, what the Republicans have successfully done is taken that anger and turned it on gay people, turned it on the abortion issue. Right. And what our job is, is to bring people together, in my view, around a progressive agenda, which is let's all work together. If you're a working person... Let's work together. You've also harshly criticized super PACs. Hillary Clinton's campaign has said that they hope to raise two billion dollars, <laughs> billion with a B, right. that way. Now, for some people who are watching, Senator, and may not be familiar 
with super PACs. Why don't you explain what they are and why you find them so sinister? Katie, as a result of the disastrous Supreme Court decision on Citizens United, what the Supreme Court essentially said to the wealthiest people in this country, you own much of the economy, now we're going to let you buy the United States government. That's what they said. They said campaign contributions are a form of freedom of speech. Now you can use your freedom to buy the United States government. You can spend as much money as you want on the political process. Now, previous to that, we had legislation that said, you want to make a campaign contribution? There's a limit, you know, roughly $5,400 that you can give to a candidate, 2500 before, 2500 after the primary. Not now. If you want to put millions of dollars, when Jeb Bush is going around the country, there are people who are putting millions of dollars into a super PAC. And that super PAC, theoretically independent of the candidacy, can then spend as much money as it wants. On issue-oriented Yeah, quote-unquote issue-oriented, yes. They can write, do these vicious personal attacks. So it is a campaign finance system where the Koch brothers themselves, second wealthiest family in this country, will spend close to $1 billion this election cycle, which is more money, Katie, than either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party will spend one family. Does that sound like democracy to you? You're refusing to use super PACs, as I mentioned. Your average campaign donor, I guess, is, is paying an average of $42 per donor. You want to raise $50 million. But with all due respect, Senator, how do you compete when Senator Clinton is saying, uh, Katie, you know, we're going to raise $2 billion? Katie, that is an excellent question. And we're just going to do the best we can. But what, what you're really saying, because it's not just Bernie Sanders, what you are really saying, as I hear it, can any candidate who is not tied in with the billionaires, who is trying to represent working families, who is trying to deal with the tough issues facing our country, can they run for office anymore? And if what you're saying is true, and it may well be true, it, frankly, let me be honest with you, it may in fact be too late. The billionaires may be too powerful, and maybe the only candidates who can win get money from the billionaires and are beholden to the billionaires. And if that's the case, you can form your judgment, but it doesn't sound to me like the democracy that men and women fought and died to defend. As a result of the disastrous Supreme Court decision, the 5-4 to four decision on Citizens United, billionaire families are now able to spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to purchase the candidates of their choice. The billionaire class now owns the economy, and they are working day and night to make certain that they own the United States government. According to media reports, it appears that one family, the extreme right-wing Koch brothers, are prepared to spend more money than either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party in the coming elections. In other words, one family, a family which is worth about a hundred billion dollars may well have a stronger political presence than either, either of our major parties. Now, I know that people are not comfortable when I say this, but I want you to take a hard look at what's going on, take a deep breath, and you tell me whether or not we are looking at a democracy or whether or not we are looking at an oligarchy. When you have one family that has more political power than the Democratic Party, than the Republican Party, which can spend unlimited sums of money not only on campaigns, but on think tanks, on media, I worry very, very much about the future of democracy in our country. And that is why it is absolutely imperative that we pass a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and, in fact, why we must move forward toward public funding of elections. I want young people out there, whatever their point of view may be, who like the idea of public service to be able to run for office, to get involved in politics without having to worry about sucking up to billionaires in order to get the support that they may need. We have another scandal out there, and that is major corporation after major corporation, many of whom have powerful lobbyists right here on Capitol Hill, not only pay nothing in taxes, but in many cases get a refund 
from the IRS. And I just want to list some 10, the 10 worst corporate tax avoiders. ExxonMobil, largest oil company in the world, made $19 billion in profits in 2009. Exxon not only paid no federal income taxes, it actually received a $156 million rebate from the IRS, according to SEC filing. So instead of throwing children off a head start or cutting back on community health centers, maybe, maybe, we want to ask ExxonMobil to actually pay taxes rather than get a refund. Bank of America, number two, received a $1.9 billion tax refund from the IRS last year. Bank of America received a $1.9 billion tax refund although it made $4.4 billion in profits, maybe they might want to contribute a little bit more before we cut back, as the Republicans want, on the Social Security Administration. Over the past five years, while General Electric made $26 billion in profits in the United States, it received a $4.1 billion refund from the IRS. Chevron received a $19 million refund from the IRS last year after it made $10 billion in profits in 2009. So if you're working stiff, you're making $30,000, $40,000 a year, you're paying taxes, but if you're Chevron and you made $10 billion in profits in 2009, you don't have to pay any taxes. You get a $19 million refund. Yeah, let's go after the little kids. Let's go after the elderly. Let's go after the sick. Let's go after the most vulnerable, but apparently in the Senate, we can't ask Chevron to pay taxes. Boeing, which received a $30 billion contract from the Pentagon to build 179 airborne tankers, got a $124 million refund from the IRS last year. Valero Energy, the 25th largest company in America, with $68 billion in sales last year, received a $157 million tax refund check from the IRS. Goldman Sachs, our ah, good friends on Wall Street, in 2008, only paid 1.1% of its income in taxes, even though it earned a profit of $2.3 billion and received an almost $800 billion, $800 billion from the Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury Department. Citigroup last year made more than $4 billion in profits, but paid no federal income taxes. ConocoPhillips, fifth largest oil company in the U.S., made $16 billion in profits from 2007 through 2009, but received a $451 million in tax breaks through the oil and gas manufacturing deductions. Over the past five years, Carnival Cruise Lines made more than $11 billion in profits, but its federal income tax rates dropped during those years. It was just 1.1%, 1.1%. So the point is, if you go out and you work for a living, you pay taxes. You pay 10, 15% of your income taxes. But if you're on Wall Street, if you're a major oil company, if you have lobbyists all over this place, not only can you avoid paying any taxes, in many cases you'll actually get a tax refund from the IRS. So what's the point? The point is that at a time when we have a $1.6 trillion deficit, maybe we have to reduce that deficit, not simply on the backs of working families, low-income people, the children, the sick, the elderly. Maybe, maybe. We might want to call for shared sacrifice. Maybe ExxonMobil and some of the large oil companies might be asked to pay something in taxes. Maybe General Electric might be asked to pay something in taxes. Maybe the wealthiest people in this country might be asked to pay something in taxes. The Walton family is the wealthiest family in America. Does anybody on the panel think that they need significant welfare help? And yet it turns out that they are the largest recipient of welfare in America. Because when you pay workers starvation wages, which is what Walmart does, how do the workers at Walmart or McDonald's or Burger King survive? Well, they get Medicaid for their kids and for themselves. They get food stamps. They live in government-sponsored affordable housing. Do you think the Walton family worth $100 billion is in need of welfare from the middle class of this country? Or do you think maybe we should raise the minimum wage so that those workers can earn a living wage and not have to get Medicaid or food stamps?
When we think about workers' rights, we understand there was a time in this country's history, and certainly our right-wing friends want to bring us back to that time, when workers had virtually no rights at all. When people who needed to feed their families were 100% dependent on their employers, if the employer didn't like their color or where they came from, if the employer was not happy if they didn't work on Saturday or Sunday, that worker was fired. That worker had no rights whatsoever. And people struggled. They struggled because they said, I am a human being. I have rights. You can't do that to me. I need dignity. And unions were formed, and people fought, and people died, and people were beaten, and people went to jail. And the goal of that effort was for people to sit down and collectively negotiate contracts with workers, get decent wages and decent benefits. That struggle took decades. When we talk about the economy, it's not just jobs, it is wages. The minimum, federal minimum wage of seven and a quarter an hour is a starvation wage. We've got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage and over a period of years to at least $15 an hour. One of the great crises facing this country is the fact that we live in a very competitive global economy. And you don't have to be a PhD in economics to understand that if we're going to compete effectively, if we're going to create the kinds of jobs we need to, we need the best educated workforce in the world. Today, listen to this. I mean, it's, it's true, it is tragic. And we scratch our heads and we say, what is going on in our country? In this country today, hundreds of thousands of bright, qualified young people, young people who want to learn, who want to go out into the world and establish their careers, they cannot go to college because their families don't have the money for them to be able to pay to go to college. And then on top of that, we have millions of people, people who recently graduated college, or maybe dropped out of college, people who are middle-aged, who are stuck with the huge and oppressive debts around their necks that last for decades. And I'm talking about huge debt. Last year, we had a meeting in Burlington, Vermont, talked to a young woman. Her crime in life was that she wanted to become a medical doctor, primary care physician, and she wanted to work with low-income people. We have a real crisis in primary care in America. That is exactly what we need. We need tens and tens of thousands of doctors going into primary health care. She came out of medical school $300,000 in debt. Two nights ago, in Davenport, I spoke to two young dentists, and one of them, a young woman from the area, said, hey, $300,000, I came out of dental school. She's graduating this week, I think. $400,000 in debt all over this country. Young people leaving college, $50,000, $60,000 in debt. Young man in my office who's worked for me for years, left law school, deeply in debt. He's paying 9% interest rates. All right, that's not uncommon, 8%, 6%. That's the way it is. What kind of stupidity is it? <laughs> and it's, it's stupidity, first of all, because it says to so many young people, hey, you're never going to make it into the middle class. You're never going to go get the job of your dreams. That's one thing. And the other thing it says is a nation. How do we compete? How do we have a strong economy? When we do not tap the intellectual capabilities of so many of our bright young people. So what's the solution to that? The solution to that is to do what many, many other countries around the world are doing. Not a radical idea. You go to Germany, you go to Scandinavia, 
You go to countries like Chile, Chile, not a wealthy nation, and what they have said and what we have got to say, if you go to a public college or university, tuition should be free. So many people are stuck with four, five, six, eight percent interest rates on student debt. So, if we're going to lower interest rates on student debt, I have introduced legislation which will allow students, graduates, to refinance their loans to take advantage of lower interest rates. Years ago, uh, the banks were uh, providing most of the loans and making the profits. Under Obama, he did the right thing. He transferred uh, that process from the banks to the government. The government is not making the money. But here's the point. We have got to ask ourselves whether the government should be making billions of dollars in profit based on high interest rates no. going to low and moderate income families. The answer is no. no. I agree with you. I, I agree with you. Uh, and when we do away with the profit making of the government, we also can lower interest rates. So, add it all together, this is what we have got to say as a nation. What we have got to say is education is an essential part of what life is about. We want to be learning until the day we die. We want to be growing intellectually. Also, we want our people to have the best possible standard of living the highest quality jobs that we can. And in a technologically evolving society, clearly we need to have a very well educated workforce. And it makes no sense to me to have policy after policy which literally discourages people from getting the education that make our country stronger and that improves their lives. So we need to radically rethink the financing of higher education. I am listening closely as a member of the Environmental Committee to what scientists throughout this country and throughout the world are saying about climate change. And what they tell us, it is real, it is caused by human activity, and we have got to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. That is what almost all scientists who study the issue are telling us. I help lead the effort in the Senate against the Keystone Pipeline because I think if we're serious about reversing climate change, you don't excavate and transport, transport some of the dirtiest fossil fuel in the world. If you were the Republican Party or, or you know, any, any group of people, you really think that you would put up the Keystone Pipeline as your first order of business. I'm against the Keystone Pipeline, fought it very hard, but God, so the people in the room may disagree with me. Do you really think that a Canadian pipeline, which will provide 35 permanent jobs, is the most important issue facing America? That you would make U.S. Senate one. That's your first bill. Or do you think it may have something to do with the fact that the Koch brothers are major owners of leases uh, in that part of, uh, of Canada? Let's talk about foreign policy, if we could. Um, you know, I know that you've said the U.S. should not lead the fight against the Yes. Islamic State. So how would you, if you were president, Good. combat the growing threat of ISIS? Good. And it certainly is a growing threat, and this is a barbaric organization. All right, you're looking at a guy who voted against the first Gulf War, who voted, not only voted against the war in Iraq, but I recently saw a speech that I gave on YouTube. And I have to tell you, much of what I said way back then turned out, unfortunately, to be right. 
Mr. Speaker, in the brief time I have, let me give you five reasons why I'm opposed to giving the President a blank check to launch a unilateral invasion and occupation of Iraq and why I will vote against this resolution. One, I have not heard any estimates of how many young American men and women might die in such a war or how many tens of thousands of women and children in Iraq might also be killed. As a caring nation, we should do everything we can to prevent the horrible suffering that a war will cause. War must be the last recourse in international relations, not the first. Second, I am deeply concerned about the precedent that a unilateral invasion of Iraq could establish in terms of international law and the role of the United Nations. If President Bush believes that the U.S. can go to war at any time against any nation, what moral or legal obligation could our government raise if another country chose to do the same thing? Third, the United States is now involved in a very difficult war against international terrorism, as we learned tragically on September 11th. We are opposed by Osama bin Laden and religious fanatics who are prepared to engage in a kind of warfare that we have never experienced before. I agree with Brent Scrowcroft, Republican former National Security Advisor for President George Bush Sr., who stated, and I quote, an attack on Iraq at this time would seriously jeopardize, if not destroy, the global counter-terrorist campaign we have undertaken, end quote. Fourth, at a time when this country has a $6 trillion national debt and a growing deficit, we should be clear that a war and a long-term American occupation of Iraq could be extremely expensive. Fifth, I am concerned about the problems of so-called unintended consequences. Who will govern Iraq when Saddam Hussein is removed? And what role will the U.S. play in an ensuing civil war that could develop in that country? Will moderate governments in the region who have large Islamic fundamentalist populations be overthrown and replaced by extremists? Will the bloody conflict between Israel and the Palestinian Authority be exacerbated? And these are just a few of the questions that remain unanswered. If a unilateral American invasion of Iraq is not the best approach, what should we do? In my view, the U.S. must work with the United Nations to make certain, within clearly defined timelines, that the U.N. inspectors are allowed to do their jobs. These inspectors should undertake an unfettered search for Iraqi weapons of mass destruction and destroy them when found pursuant to past UN resolutions. If Iraq resists inspection and elimination of stockpiled weapons, we should stand ready to assist the UN in forcing compliance. I thank the gentleman. It is very easy to criticize the president, you know, but this is an enormously complicated issue. We are here today because of the disastrous blunder of the Bush-Cheney era, which got us into this war in Iraq in the first place, which then developed the can of worms that we're trying to deal with right now. Where we are right now is you have a region with Saudi Arabia, with Turkey, with Jordan. Uh, you have a number of countries controlled by very wealthy families who are asking the United States to take the lead. My point is, that if it is the United States versus ISIS, we become a propaganda, it becomes real propaganda for ISIS. So here is this Western country, here is this Christian country, rally behind ISIS. What's going on there is a war for the soul of Islam. And those people who believe in the truth about Islam, who are not, you know, crazy people, destructive people, they're gonna have to come, they're gonna have to get their hands dirty in this, they're gonna have to stand up and fight. The United States should be supportive, along with other countries, but we cannot and should not be involved in perpetual warfare in the Middle East. The Muslim countries themselves have gotta lead the effort. We should be supportive, other countries should be supportive. The vote on Iraq, whether it's Hillary Clinton saying who authorized it, saying I made a mistake, or Jeb Bush kind of talking about it and getting himself into some political hot water seems to be re-emerging. Uh, do you think that should matter? It does, in this sense. Um, it's a question of judgment. Hillary Clinton had the same information I expect that I had. I did not believe Dick Cheney. I did not believe Don Rumsfeld. I did not believe the analysis that President Bush made. I said, I don't think that that makes sense to me. I voted no. Other people voted yes. But you could take that argument in other ways. I voted against the deregulation of Wall Street. Bill Clinton said, he said, it's a great idea, and many of the Democrats said, it is a great idea, let's merge the commercial banks with, with uh, the, the insurance companies, uh, and, and this will really be good. I never bought that for one second. In fact, I had an interchange with Alan Greenspan, 
where I kind of told them, you have this kind of concentration, it's going to lead to bad things. So it, what it is, is it's not just the war. It's a question of judgment and analyzing data. This is not just an American problem. This is an international crisis. This is a regional crisis. And I think the people of America are getting sick and tired of the world and the region, Saudi Arabia and the other countries saying, hey, we don't have to do anything about it. The American taxpayer and American soldiers will do all the work for us. Most people don't know is that Saudi Arabia is the fourth largest defense spender in the world, more than the UK, more than France. They have an army which is probably seven times larger than ISIS. They have a major air force. Why don't they see this as a crisis situation? Here's the danger, Candy. If the Middle East people perceive this as the United States versus ISIS, the West versus East, Christianity versus Islam, we're going to lose that war. This is a war for the soul of Islam, and the Muslim nations must be deeply involved. And to the degree that developed countries are involved, it should be the UK, France, Germany, other countries as well. So I worry very much, and I go out around Vermont and around the country, and people are saying, yeah, we're concerned about ISIS, but we're also concerned about the collapse of the American middle class an infrastructure sure. which is falling apart, the need to create jobs in America. We can't do it alone. It has to be an international and a regional coalition. Why aren't other countries more deeply involved? I will tell you why. Okay. Because they believe that the American taxpayers are going to do it and American soldiers ultimately will do it. And as long as that signal is out there, that is what's going to happen. I want the Saudi Arabian government to be actively involved. I want their troops to be on the ground. I don't want them to believe that we're going to do it for them. So, yes, I think we have to play a very strong and supportive role with the U.K., with France, with Canada, with other countries. It cannot and should not be the United States alone. We have been at war for 12 years. We have spent trillions of dollars. I'm chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. We have 500,000 young men and women who have come, up, come home with PTSD and TBI. What I do not want and I fear very much, is the United States getting sucked into a quagmire and being involved in perpetual warfare year after year after year. That is my fear. So I do not want to see the United States get involved in another quagmire in the Middle East. I'm sitting here wondering where Saudi Arabia is, mm -hmm. where Kuwait is, where Qatar is. Saudi Arabia spends more money on defense then they're the fourth largest defense spender in the entire world, more than the United Kingdom, more than France. Mm -hmm. I want to see them get their hands dirty. I want to see them starting to use their air force in a significant way. I think we should be supportive. But this war will not be won by the United States alone. It will be won by people in the neighborhood, by Saudi Arabia, by Iran, and those countries prepared to take on ISIS. Well, why do you think they're so slow to action? Why do you think we saw a video on Friday of ISIS advancing and Turkish uh, military just watching well within shooting range? Well, you know why? Because I think they have full confidence that the people of the United States are going to do the dirty work for mm. them. And I'll be damned if kids in the state of Vermont or taxpayers in the state of Vermont have to defend the royal Saudi family, which is worth hundreds of billions of dollars and which, as I said a moment ago, has a major and significant air force and army. We should be supportive, but this is going to have to be a war won by the Muslim countries themselves taking on this dangerous and horrendous organization. It cannot be won, and it will not be won, by the United States alone. Uh, today I want to talk uh, about two major issues facing our country. The first is the need for comprehensive immigration reform. to me, and I think a growing majority of the American people, that millions of folks in this country are working extremely hard, but they are living in the shadows, and that has got to end. And the second issue that I want to touch on is that we need an economy today which benefits all of our people, the middle class, working families, lower income people, and not just 
a handful of billionaires. It is no great secret that across the United States, undocumented workers perform a critical role in our economy. They harvest and process our food, and it is no exaggeration to say that without them, food production and agriculture in this country would significantly decline. Undocumented workers build many of our homes, they cook our meals, they maintain our landscapes. We even entrust undocumented workers with that which we hold most dear, the well-being of our children. Despite the central role that undocumented workers play in our economy and in our daily lives, these workers are too often reviled by many for political gain and shunted into the shadows. Let me be very clear as to where I stand. It is time for this disgraceful situation to end. This country faces enormous problems, and they will not be solved unless we are united. It is time to end the politics of division in this country, of politicians playing one group of people off against another group, whether it is white against black, male against female, straight against gay, or native born against immigrant. That's a vision of Now, as all of you know, there are a lot of angry people out there all across the country. Some of them are in the Occupy Wall Street movement and consider themselves progressives. Some are in the Tea Party movement and consider themselves conservatives. But let me give you an explanation as to why they have every right in the world to be angry. Despite an explosion of technology, despite a huge increase in productivity, Despite all of the so-called benefits of the global economy, millions of American workers today are working longer hours for low wages, and we have more people living in poverty than almost any time in the history of our country. Since 1999, the typical middle-class family, the family right in the middle of the economy, has seen its income go down by almost $5,000 after adjusting for inflation. Incredibly, that family earned less income last year than it did 26 years ago, back in 1989. That is why people are angry. They're working longer hours for low wages. They're seeing an explosion of technology. They're watching TV and seeing all the great benefits, supposedly, of the global economy. And they're working longer hours for low wages, and they're scared to death as to what is going to happen to their kids. What kind of jobs? are their kids going to have? Are we better off today, economically, than we were six years ago when President Bush left office? Of course we are. But anyone who doesn't understand the suffering, anxiety, and fear that the middle class and working families of our country are experiencing today has no idea about what's going on in the economy, and I fear very much a lot of the pundits here on Capitol Hill don't understand that. It might be a good idea to get off of Capitol Hill, go into the real world, and find out what's going on with working people. Meanwhile, while the middle class continues to disappear, the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. And the gap between the very, very rich and everybody else is growing wider and wider. An example. An example. The top 25 hedge fund managers made more than $24 billion dollars in 2013. That is equivalent to the full salaries of more than 425,000 public school teachers. Anyone really think that is morally acceptable, economically acceptable? Is that really what our country should be about? You know, we all have friends who have problems with alcohol, right? 
<laughs> we have friends who have problems with drugs. But I think what you're looking at now is a certain number of very wealthy and powerful people who have a, pow a, a problem with greed and power. You bet. You know, and it's, it's an addiction. They need more and more. But again, I don't know why you need billions more. Right? And we have got to stand united. And when we do that, there is nothing that we as a people cannot accomplish. It embarrasses me, yeah. it embarrasses me to tell you about what these other countries are doing for their people and we're not doing it. But in order to do that, we do need a political revolution. Let me just simply tell you what that means. It means that you can't have elections as we did last November where 63% of the people don't vote, where 80% of young people don't vote. What we have to do is change our culture so that people understand that politics in a democratic society and involvement in the political process is what patriotism is about. So when people tell you, oh, you know, politics is all crap, why are you coming here on a beautiful afternoon to hear some senator from a state no one ever heard of? You know, why are you coming here? And you tell them because you're concerned about the future of this country. You want to hear ideas. So what I'm asking you to do is to help me make a political revolution in which we build a strong mass movement. I don't mind when wealthy people, the billionaires, come out against me. I kind of expect that. But I do get upset in hearing working people voting for candidates yeah. who are going to send their jobs abroad, who are going to take their kids off of health insurance, who are going to make it harder to send their kids to college. that there are divisive issues. I know not everybody in this room is pro-choice. And there are probably divisions on guns, and there are divisions on gay marriage and all that stuff. I understand that. Fine, in a democratic society we can disagree. Trust me, my wife and I disagree. And I hear it all the time. All right. But on economic issues, let's reach out to our brothers and our sisters and our co-workers and our neighbors and say, no, don't vote against your kids and your parents. Don't vote for people who want to destroy Social Security and send your job abroad. If we do that, if we involve millions of people in this campaign, man, we can create a country the likes of which no one has ever seen. One of the problems that we have got to deal with right now, and I think Jim was referring to this, is all over this country, you got a lot of bright, decent, good people, and they're saying, you know what? Situation is hopeless. You can't beat the Koch brothers, you can't beat the billionaires, you can't win, I'm giving up. That is exactly what they want us to believe. And I beg of you, do not enter that world of despair. We can win this fight if we stand together. In order to win this struggle, we are going to need nothing less than a political revolution. And let me tell you what I mean by a political revolution. When, as was the case in this last election in November, when 63% of the American people chose not to vote, when 80% of young people, when 75% of low-income workers chose not to vote, what we need to do is create a momentum so that 70, 80, 90 percent of the people vote, and when that happens, we win hands down. My Republican colleagues, who, by the way, went to war in Iraq, went to war in Afghanistan, and forgot to pay for those wars, which will end up costing us between four and six trillion dollars, they have now decided that they want to balance the budget on the backs of the elderly and the children and the most vulnerable people in this country. They want to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We need for people in Congress, Republicans, and, as Jim Hightower reminded us, Democrats, to know that people are watching them. That if they're not going to vote for jobs, they're going to lose their job. And if they're not going to vote for health care, they're going to lose their health care. And for those people who say that we've got to cut Social Security, that we've got to cut benefits for disabled veterans, we say over our dead bodies.
Do we need to have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth? No, we don't. Do we need to have a e economic situation where 99% of income goes to the top 1%? No, we don't. So what my hope is, is twofold. First of all, to repeat, Bernie Sanders can't do it alone. We have got to do it together through a strong grassroots movement. And second of all, we have got to think big, not small. We have got to, in our own minds, and our own hearts, imagine a nation and a government which works for all of us, not a government dominated by a handful of billionaires and campaign contributors and well-paid lobbyists. We can create that America because when we stand together, there are a heck of a lot more of us than them. So let's go forward together. Thank you very, very much.